and thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I'm very welcoming you to our first webinar we have in Asia Pacific as uh, on behalf of SP artificial lift and gas fuel liquidification technical section. So for today, uh, first of all, I am Fatima Mehran. I am Asia, Asia Pacific regional champion. And uh, I will go through the agenda and brief introduction about what is this technical section as it is very new. And um, so uh, this is our agenda. Uh, uh, me, I'm going through a very uh, detailed, uh, of very brief of introduction artificial lift technical section. And then uh, we have David Lee, which you already seen in the flyer. He has uh, more than 50 years experience in gas lift uh, um, design and operation. And he's gonna share us uh, uh, all his global experience from many fields he has worked at today. Uh, and uh, uh, and the, the topic is very generic, uh, which is suitable for all level about what is uh, and what is not ghastly. And then we go through uh, uh, Terry's discussion, which is about, uh, which is about uh, Asia challenges and best practices we have in, um, in Asia Pacific. And then uh, the last, we have 10 minute, 10 minute question and answer. And I would like to highlight here that please uh, keep your question and put it in a QA and a uh, chat room. So at the end, uh, we go through all and we try to answer it. And hopefully we can uh, answer the whole session as we have only 10 minutes. Uh, next one, please. Okay, so first of all, uh, talking briefly about what is the artificial lift and gas uh, technical section. Actually, this is a, a new section under production technology uh, technical center, uh, technical section. And the reason um, SPE recognized and uh, had uh, put a, a dedicated section for artificial lift was because we see a very important uh, uh, aspect of artificial lift knowledge sharing and discussion uh, is uh, uh, really important to have a dedicated section for that. And we see a little bit lack of communication. And that's why uh, since July, this section is introduced to uh, as part of technical section under production. And the, the mission of this section is uh, to engage more and highly in very high level and low level in SP technical community in sharing knowledge and best practice through the discussion of artificial lift and uh, to also understand the, what is the technology advancement and what is the technology gaps. It's also a very good and a very professional channel for both operator companies and also service provider to come through understanding what is the technology uh, advancement, what's uh, new technology is available, what is a gap we have in the current situation, uh, especially with pandemic uh, situation we have um, uh, lots of uh, challenges, but at the same time, lots of opportunity for companies uh, providing technology. Uh, so hopefully, uh, by uh, by having you and all dedicated uh, engagement from your side, we can reach to the level to have a better understanding of the uh, adopting uh, gas lift technology with the current situation. Next, please. Okay, the first I'm going through the, um, the organization of artificial lift technology we have. This section, uh, we have Hassan Karimi from Shalomberge as a chairman, and we have um, other people as a program chair, members, uh, membership chair, and uh, advisory team directors. And at the same time, we have some regional champion for very main uh, kind of uh, important uh, regions, such as Asia Pacific, which is me. And uh, we want, uh, apart from global webinar we have, not only webinar, training session, discussion, uh, professional networking, we want to have also dedicated section uh, for each region because it's very important. We understand our resources. We understand our challenges that we have in the area. And uh, for that, uh, we started actually our first activity with that webinar. Next. Okay. So um, actually, uh, since uh, July and August, we were uh, working on organization uh, for this technical section. And uh, since October, we started our webinar. So far, we had two global webinars. 
Uh, first was effect of fluid over pump and the uh, soccer road pump system performance, which was uh, presented by Dr. Garib. Uh, and also the second one was a new lift uh, method by Dr. Paul Waltrich in November. And this is a third one, which I can call it the first for Asia and a first for all uh, local region. So, um, and also something I have to mention, uh, if you are part of community or if you are an SP member, the global uh, webinar also is open and free for all of you. But the reason we have, another reason we have dedicated section for each domain because um, each region, because uh, the timing of the global normally is set up to Western Europe and uh, US, which is very not uh, comfortable for Asia, normally it's midnight. Uh, but if the, there is timing like late night, you can still uh, can uh, attend and you can learn from there. Next. Okay, uh, I would like to also invite all of you uh, in any level you have, if you like to be part of this technical community as a volunteer uh, for SP technical section, uh, either if you are in high level, uh, we would like to invite you for knowledge sharing and presenting your best practices and challenges. Uh, also, we would like to have operation uh, company representative, um, uh, company like Petronas, uh, ONGC, PDP, Exxon, and et cetera. Uh, for junior and um, uh, level that still like to have a uh, be part of this, uh, they can also send me uh, a, a message and email separately. And uh, we still have need for communication, for administration, for organizing event. We still need help, help uh, from um, those people that are interested. Okay. And the next slide, I want to talk about the overall membership experience membership we have. Uh, so as you can see, this light uh, blue is um, part of uh, South Asia and the Pacific, which is quite good number uh, comparing, if I want to compare, we are as big as Canada, as big as Middle East, and as big as North Sea, uh, which is quite considerable, but we can definitely be bigger as, um, as we are growing. There are so many new field, gas fields uh, discovered in other South part of Asia. So uh, I would like to uh, ask you and uh, ask you for help that please, for those of your colleague and friend that are not member or didn't renew, remind them because we want to have everyone in that, especially for artificial leave, we want to make sure everyone is aware of that. And I know there are so many experts that they can share their knowledge, but they are not part of us. And they don't know, I will uh, explain in the next slide that for so many people, they can even get the free membership. It's not necessarily paying. So if we go to next slide, I, I explain you that uh, apart from a general benefit that um, SP has, such as professional networking, mentoring, free for a student, a scholarship for a student and all, actually with the COVID uh, pandemic that uh, presented or came in 2019, SP decided to have extra benefit. Uh, for example, for those affected uh, their job by pandemic, they, they can get a free membership uh, or uh, there is an insurance program uh, for those that they don't have insurance from the company anymore. And in addition, there is exclusive one petrol discount that you can go uh, still do your research, whatever, um, whatever paper you need, you can get it from there. Uh, by that, I again uh, ask you for help. Some people doesn't know that they have benefit. They can get free membership or very discounted. Uh, there is a lot of, actually this year, as we get more active, we have a lot of free webinar and technical that is can, can be uh, very good uh, for learning. At the same time, it's a very good uh, networking. Uh, like for example, in our SPKL um, section, uh, we have even, uh, a, a file for job searching and we help people that losing job uh, to help them to find the job. So uh, I appreciate if you pass this message, uh, message to your colleague and friend that especially those affected uh, by the situation. So can we go to next? Okay, so now I leave, uh, I try to make it short. So I hand over to David uh, to, to take you through his journey with what is gas lift and what is not gas lift. Thank you so much, David. Okay, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you 
Fatima for your introduction. I'm sorry for the uh, background. I um, I can't repair it on the fly and I was given too short a notice to get rid of it, but uh, just bear with me as we go through the talk. Um, I think what you're mainly interested in is looking at the slides, not looking at me and listening to the information. Of course, as uh, Fatima said, I was going to give you 50 years of knowledge in um, 15 minutes. And we all know that's absolutely impossible. But um, what I'm going to try and do is give you an idea of just how large the artificial lift and the gas lift side of it is. And um, for those who may be new to the area and even those who are experienced, that currently in the world, up to 80% of the world's production is artificially lifted. And now we're talking coal seam gas and even gas wells are being artificially lifted. Um, we won't go through too much of this. Uh, there I am. I spent 16 years in geophysical operations. I've worked um, all around the globe. Um, I had uh, 14 years with Shell as a global subject matter expert operating out of The Hague in the Netherlands and um, the la also teaching in the uh, Shell Training Centre in Ryswijk. Um, my last three years was advising ADCO, the uh, national oil company um, in Abu Dhabi on consignment from Shell uh, on their artificial lift strategy. And then after I retired, I've been doing some ad hoc gas consulting and training for various companies. Um, I have a background uh, of the, my time with Shell on research and development programs uh, with CO2 tracer, bubble breaker, small bubbles, electric gas lift valve, the automated valve tester, gas lift valve tracking and reliability database, and gas lift valve performance testing. Okay. We can see that um, gas lift can be looked at as having five skill levels. So at various areas, will, you will have the different um, levels required for your discipline or for the position you're in. But you normally people start out with an awareness, which is gaining a good understanding of the subject and being able to ask the relevant questions. Next is having the knowledge and that's active application and participation that you require help or advice. I'm sorry, this is really slow for some reason. Skill level performs tasks to a high standard, does not require help and can teach others. Mastery, a very high skill level with extremely broad experience, ability to coach others at the skill level and recognizes a company or global industry level. Finally, the expert level, where you're recognized as a principal technical expert within the organization, sought after as a distinguished lecturer, and you have the ability to advise and liaise with the highest corporate and government levels. We all know the definition of gas lift. It's the process of injecting gas at high pressure into the wellboard as a lifting medium. The main purpose is to reduce the bottom hole pressure drawdown so that the reservoir fluid can flow up the well bore at the desired rate. One thing that uh, we is one of the challenges, and um, Terry will go into a lot more of the challenges further on, but um, gas lift in itself is a challenge. Um, the whole understanding, the acceptance, and um, the view of it is a challenge. But in most cases, we have a perception in the industry that gas lift or optimization or surveillance um, is a project, but it's not. It's a process. Most of our early stages, like identify, select, define, execute, are very small in the term of the life of a field. But operating the field can be 20 to 80 years or longer. So. One of our biggest challenges and one of the things that gas lift is, is being able to 
obtain training. So any training program or skills workshop should be looking into the key fundamentals of gas lift employed in optimizing your production process in a safe and continuous manner. Material presented should be able to refresh or deepen already re um, acquired skills in being part of a gas lift operation. The major components of a gas lift system, application of gas lift, surveillance process roadmap, troubleshooting, surveillance and software. A significant outcome of the training should be to understand your role and the role of others in what is a continual process, not a finite project. Everything in your system is connected, both upstream and downstream. Everything that happens in that system has an impact on individual wells, the process system, the reservoir, in different ways and to different degrees. The process that is gas lift field operations and optimization, in my experience, is closer to an infinity loop than the normal visualization of a circle. It's mainly the four elements of monitor, analyze, improve, and integrate, then back to monitor in a continuous cycle. You need to understand that you or your function are not a single scene or act in the show. You're a ringmaster, and I'll expand on this later, who must know how every element and every participant has its place in the continuity of the complete performance. It's not about just being able to do a gas lift design or being a wizard, Prosper, Winglue, Wellflow, or any of the other softwares, although a lot of people do like to think that's all it comprises is being able to do a design. You should come away with an understanding that you do not need to know everything, but you should know where or who to find the answers. That will mean understanding every element from the reservoir to the point of custody transfer to varying levels. And that's where we saw our five levels at the beginning. You should understand that each element of gas lift will require various skill levels. Awareness, knowledge, skill, mastery, and expert. So what should you be exposed to? Well, during your life in the oil industry, you're going to be exposed to lots of different forms of artificial lift. You may not always stay in the one area. You may, because we're global, you may move to other areas. So you're going to be exposed to different types of artificial lift. You're going to be exposed to artificial lift selection methods and criteria as a, as a field develops. They may change the artificial lift. The benefits and shortfalls of gas lift and other methods. How gas lift works. Different types of gas lift. Flow regimes. Gas lift in coal seam gas and coal bed methane wells is becoming a huge industry. Troubleshooting and optimization, modeling, well surveys, well testing, strategy development, and as I said before, WRFM, well reservoir and facilities management. You'll need to understand, at least in a broad overview, what makes up the physical network system. So everything, we have reservoir, well strings, gauges, metering, headers, pressure vessels, compression, data transmission, and people, very important. We have hardware, we have mandrels, we have software and we have peopleware. In addition to the production chemistry, geology, reservoir engineering, production technology, the gas lift processes are made up of these three significant components. And you'll see I did include peopleware. To me, people are a have a significant input. Getting to know little things like um, how your gas lift valves work, learning about bellows protection, maximum dome charge, stem travel, metallurgy, elastomers, pressure ratings, latchings, gas lift valve performance. Um, there's a section in most uh, softwares now that is called VPC, which is Valve Performance Clearinghouse, and they have correlations that are used in the performance of your valves in your design. Here we go. We go to software, and of course, we know there is a large amount of software out there. We have data collection, we have data transmission, we have data historians, well modeling, well surveys, 
gas lift design, surface modeling, mass balance, um, reservoir modeling. Artificial lift selection is a huge thing if you come to uh, be starting in a new field or a redevelopment of an old field and you're looking at what are the most appropriate artificial lift methods, you'll go through and you'll find that it's just not about picking what you think might be the best, but it's also the various operating depths, operating volumes, corrosion handling, gas handling, solids handling, fluid gravity, servicing. What's the prime mover for the, uh, the system? Offshore applications, onshore applications, overall efficiency. There are a number of ways of doing this. You can traffic light a number of the different elements that you have to look at. And you can see down here, we have a huge number of the different elements and how they apply to gas lift, ESP, PCP, beam pump, and what is required. People wear. And this is extremely important because one of the challenges that we have in the artificial lift industry and especially in gas lift is we have to have continuity and sustainability of knowledge and skills and the people to do this. Normally, most of you out there are all looking to move to the corner office and become a boss and tell people what to do. But what happens when you move on? Who takes your place? Handovers are traditionally terrible. You're supposed to have a four or five month handover. It, tends, it turns out it's normally four or five days. So your replacement ends up getting maybe four hours or 50% of your knowledge. They go and do the same thing. So the next person gets 50% of the 50%. After that, you get 50% of the 50% of the 50%. So after four iterations, you end up with people sitting in the job who think they know everything, but they haven't been properly handed over. So in people where we have reservoir engineers, we have production technologists, we have wireline technicians, production operators, well testers, instrument technicians, workshop hands, gas lift technicians. One of the most important things I learned in my whole lifetime in the field, that the people in the field are your eyes, your ears and your hands. They are the ones that know more about the worlds than any screen or model may present to you no matter what you may think. Gas lift workshop techs must know their role and responsibilities. Otherwise the valves that go into your wells that are supposed to lift your wells efficiently will not be the appropriate valves. You'll need to understand the importance of inflow, outflow and nodal analysis. How vertical lift profiles are transferred to full field surface modeling, multi-phase flow, gas liquid ratios, equilibrium curves and well stability. Gas lift mandrel design and gas lift valve redesign using Prosper, Winglow, any of the software products and knowing the difference between IPO and PPO valves, when to use them. Are you working on dual wells, which is a large number of wells in the Asian region uh, in our offshore environment are dual completions and they are terribly difficult to understand, operate, troubleshoot and optimize. You'll need to be familiar with unloading and kickoff of the well and what happens during the process. You will know the standards and guidelines, API ISO, for the safe unloading to prevent any gas lift valve damage. Surveillance and troubleshooting. Um, you should be able to learn to show and discuss typical problems encountered. You should be able to build a generic surveillance process map. You should be able to conduct a health check process for your gas lift operation or your artificial lift operation. Understanding the importance of data and calibration of well test data to match the flowing gradient survey output. New methods of surveillance, distributed temperature sensors, well tracer, gas tracer diagnostics. So I've only been able to give you just a small insight of some of the operational facets that should be in your personal toolkit. 
Any training you receive or give should offer real world experience. Training should present knowledge that appreciates every skill level without exclusion. And I mean that just because you may have a PhD, don't forget that the technicians are a integral part of your knowledge and training. It should also draw on the experience of participants within the training you do to enhance the skill transfer between participants. It should recognise that everyone has to start somewhere while others may only need just refreshment. Trainers understand that some may not see the depth of material is necessary for them. We as presenters understand that they're wrong. Gas lift is not a single point skill. You may be headed for a corner office or a senior position, but if you don't have the knowledge, you can't be a leader. You need to understand that a lifetime of knowledge and experience cannot be transferred in a couple of sessions, just like I can't do it in the 20 minutes I've got. The outcome should be that you will end up with a deeper knowledge of what can and does have an impact. You'll also learn to three, speak new three, three new languages. You'll learn to speak manager, engineer and field technician operator. I've just been asked uh, also earlier to uh, include a slide addressing well integrity with respect to gas lift. So here goes, very quick overview. Well integrity and pressure requirements are addressed at the well design stage and would include the future possibility of gas lift and any compressor specifications. Side pocket mandrels are only a section of the production tubing that are workshop pressure tested at some assembly makeup. A gas lift mandrel is just a very expensive pup joint. Remember that. Then again, they are tested at this, in the workshop. Then again, they're tested at the wellhead on makeup in the tubing string. Then finally at the tubing integrity tests. So side pocket mandrels are tested up to three times. The tubing string and connections are only tested once, but everyone tries to blame the side pocket mandrels. Gas lift valves are tested in the gas lift shop on installation in the subassembly, and again, a tubing integrity test. If you don't have premium packing installed, then that's your fault. You didn't set the technical specifications for your valves. You should now be ensuring that all valves have premium check darts as well. Gas lift gas should be dry sales quality gas. If it's not, then your biggest problem is not the production tubing. Your problems are production casing, flow lines and compressor. So as we get to finishing, here's a few questions just to consider in your mind. Would you be able to do a rough hand drawing of your gas lift system from the reservoir to the custody transfer point with approximate pressures and flows? Do you know the specific gravity of your gas lift gas? When was it last sampled and where was it sampled? How important is temperature on the opening and closing of your gas lift valves, downhole and in the workshop? What sort of meters do you have installed for your gas lift? Do you have two or three phase separators? Is there a pressure difference between your production and test separators? When was the last time you visited the field and spent time with your operators? When was the last time your operation staff received gas lift skills training? What temperature settings is used in the gas lift lab? What's IPO and what's PPO? During the unloading process, unloading of your well, are the valves open as gas is injected? Do you know what a limit diagram does? Finally, you may not always be in gas lift. You may have made it to the corner office, but you must remember your wells and your field will always be on gas lift. So it's a part of your world. Why do you think you need to have the knowledge across the broad, such a broad skill base? The answer is, after 50 years of working in the industry, my colleagues and I have found that 999 times out of 1,000, a gas lift problem is not a gas lift problem. It's almost exclusively a mechanical, 
reservoir, process, or measurement issue. So as the gas lit person, you have to be able to solve everyone else's problems because they know that you know more about the whole system than they do. And their initial knee-jerk reaction to everything is, oh, it's a gas lift problem. Thank you for your time. And we'll be addressing questions um, at the end of the, uh, the whole presentation. But thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Hi, good afternoon, so good evenings, or good morning to those of you who are in different time zones. My name is Terry Wee. I have about 18 years of experience. I've been working in the Asia regions uh, for quite a number of years. So hopefully today I'll be able to uh, point out some of the challenges we face in Asia. Um, predominantly, we're going to be pointing out the challenges we face in offshore. Uh, Asia, because that's the thing that we felt like, you know, that's facing a lot of challenges, it's quite different from uh, onshore operations. So without further ado, I will get on with my slides. Sorry, just getting the, uh, the slide to work for me. Sorry guys, I, I've just been talking to myself uh, for the last few minutes. Forgot to uh, unmute myself, so let me start again. So my name is Terry Wee. I've been working in Asia for a number of years. Um, similar like David Lee, I, we used to work in, um, in Shell. So I've been, uh, I was working as his colleagues before. Um, so today I'll be talking a few challenges that we face in Asia. Um, so if you look at Asia, um, we'll be talking about offshore environments. I think this is where the challenges really face uh, and present itself, you know, to uh, gas leave. Uh, um, so uh, in Asia, such as let's say, you know, Malaysia, um, the oil production offshore started about 1950. So that is just right after, uh, you know, the Second World War. So we are fast forwarding to the current time. You, you know, we are dealing with a lot of platforms and facility that are very old. And a lot of them are actually way past the design life. So normally for design purpose, you know, a facility are designed for 25 years. So we definitely have gone way past that. Um, so we are in an era that we are having uh, very old uh, vintage platforms, very old vintage equipments, but at the same time, we also have very new modern facility that is building on next to the old facilities. Um, let's look at the, uh, the old uh, equipments. Uh, as, as you know, they really point out, you know, gas is really not just one well, you know, it's really a system. So you really have to look at all different components. Um, but at the same time, we have this old facility most of them are actually obsolete, you know. Uh, you, you try to buy the spare part, it's quite difficult to, to buy them. And, you know, um, sourcing a spare part is, is can be quite problematic for procurement. And, and also, if you have to upgrade the uh, equipment to a later specs, you know, um, whether the existing uh, remaining reserve will be able to pay off that, that upgrade. So that, again, is a challenge. And, and, and also, you look at, you know, the workforce that is used to maintaining and, 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 and uh, work the uh, old facilities, you know, they might not be in, in the industry anymore because as you know that, you know, with the big crew chains, a lot of them actually exit the workforce. Um, so we have these uh, vintage equipments and they still have to operate and, you know, what kind of reliability and uptime can we, you know, we, we can actually expect from them. Um, I'm not sure uh, um, whether you, you realize actually some of the gas lift well don't exactly like, you know, interruptions. The gas lift actually Gas lifted well actually prefer a continuous uh, kind of operation. They don't really like, you know, start off, start off, you know, that kind of scenario. And this is kind of scenario that we normally face when we have, uh, you know, where we all compressors that, you know, sometimes this is don't work all the time and we get very low uh, uptime. So that is a challenge. Um, I also have experience in trying to retrofit some of the conventional wells, some older wells to be a uh, smart gas lifted well. Um, and that itself is a big challenge. And it actually, in, in my experience, it actually took me two years to, um, to basically change uh, 60 gas lifted well from the old system to a new system. So that really required a lot of perseverance. Um, the next thing I want to go into is about integrity. I think David Lee has already mentioned slightly on about integrity. Um, 
so imagine you've tried to optimize a uh, gas the wells, you know, say the well has got, you know, four uh, gas the well, four different mangoes. Um, you really try to optimize the lifting depth, but if you have lots of leaks inside the tubings and, and that can sometimes compromise the designs. For example, if you have a leak above the top mandrels, you will be, you know, get you know, shallow gas lifting all the times, which means that you can't really, you know, achieve the uh, gas design that you want. So um, for very old wells, uh, especially well with a lot of CO2, Two and uh, water production, so this can be a, a propelling uh, scenario. Um, another scenario, it could be you know some of the older well might have you know casing issues. For example, you uh, we, we normally inject gas to the uh, casing air or the uh, production casings, but because of the integrity issue in the outer casings, um, the uh, operating pressure of the uh, uh, of the casing air have to be derated to a lower pressure. And that would again affect the gas leaf injections performance across the gas leaf wall and also lift the amount of gas that we can send into the well to lift the oil. Um, so that again can be a challenge. Uh, another challenge is a little bit tricky is when we have uh, behind casing uh, cement issues where um, we have a cross flow between the rest of the zone. You're trying to basically uh, um, lift the well to efficient depth, you know, trying to optimize the gas lead, but really you cannot control the cross flow behind, you know, behind the casing. So in some cases, we could be, you know, doing a gas lead valve change out to optimize the gas lead, but you know, you, you do increase uh, gas injections and you're lifting a deeper depth. But then what ha what happened is that sometimes you know you you have a sudden increase in water cuts, and and that's got nothing to do with gas lifting, and that is just because you know behind the casing. Um, that you know the casing has given away you know in terms of the cementations and the water have found a new path coming into the well bowl. So that is another challenge that we face. Now let's fast forward to the modern facilities. Um, sorry, let me just go back one slide. Um, so I think uh, it's becoming quite. Hmm, Sorry, just struggling with the slides today. Right. Okay. So, um, so you probably have heard a lot, you know, a lot of uh, buzz around, you know, uh, data analytics, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learnings, and and also investing, you know, a huge amount of money into building up, uh, you know, database, you know, putting all the gauges and getting all kind of data. Um, so that is good. And we found that uh, in Asia, uh, you know, you have a lot of new platforms that are very well equipped with the latest technology. Um, but at the same time, so we found that um, a lot of the younger generation, like the millennial workforce, they actually uh, have not spent a lot of time in trainings. And because of that, they were unable to get a very deep insight of the gas lift data. And, and very often, so you, you might be able to get, you know, data from the gauges, but really you, you also have to put in the data into the software to actually, you know, to get a better insight from the software. And very often you see that um, a lot of the, uh, the younger workforce hasn't trained up in that area. And, and that is, uh, is, uh, is a bottleneck in terms of getting the, uh, the insight from the data. And very often you, uh, we, we see that, you know, we have, you know, uh, say for example, you have a field that has got hundreds of wells and very often you only have very good data only for a small percentage of the, uh, the whole population. So you have like, you know, new platforms that is, you know, uh, you have 10 wells that install with the latest technology, but then you have 90 odds well that is, you know, legacy well that hasn't got any uh, data, it doesn't have any gauges and then, you know, how, how do you optimize the whole network because, you know, it is a network that we're talking about, you know, just by optimizing one well, you cannot get the whole network effect. So that is the challenge. Um, so let's come back to the data. Um, so you probably have seen a lot of the uh, big organization has actually invested a lot of money in building up data, uh, you know, management data base and, and, you know, putting a lot of money into making the infrastructures. But very often the way the data management is structured, it's often done without the uh, the thinking of you know uh, of the importance of gas lift. So very often they will have some of the uh, the basic information like you know uh, keeping air pressures, casing air pressures, but very often lacking 
uh, the important information like you know uh, data about the gasoline work you know what kind of sizes and what kind of capacity and what is the manufacturers and and just how long the work has been in a downhole um, so very often it's data like that that's really required for another a deeper level of optimizations now we, we go to uh, another uh, category is a modern equipment so yes indeed you know with the you know uh, with the uh, advancements of uh, technology and investments r and d you know we are seeing you know a new uh, generation of meters and gauges you know whether it's a surface or downhole uh, even now we have elect electric uh, gas lift uh, wafer um, what we see is that sometimes you know you, you have very advanced uh, very complicated uh, equipments very often it requires a very skilled workforce to calibrate to maintain and very often um, big organization like in, in the big operators organizations um, they don't naturally have that kind of skill set because they rely on you know the service uh, you know provider to have that kind of skill set um, and very often uh, Asia uh, might not have that kind of skill set, very often because the equipment is coming from, you know, from the Western world, you know, that is where we the origin of the, uh, of that, you know, competency. And they don't always have that kind of um, competence people just residing in Asia. So sometimes, especially now, you know, with the COVID-19, you know, if we have to mobilize uh, expert from outside, you know, Malaysia or outside Asia, you know, you can see, you know, the pain in actually in this kind of situations. I'm gonna go over to uh, the next uh, the next topic. I think it's really an elephant in the room is the uh, how do we address you know the big crew change. Um, so I already mentioned that you know we have uh, you know a younger work you know younger workforce coming into you know into the uh, communities and and they are actually coming at a younger age. You know you look at you know um, the number of years they spend in 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 the academic world is not really that that huge. Um, once they go into the corporate uh, environments, um, the expectation is that they will have to rise up the ladder very quickly. Um, and that sometimes is quite challenging for gas lift community because gas lift, um, I'm sure you already heard from David, you know, is really, uh, it's, it's a very elusive art, you know, it's very easy to do, you know, uh, the concept is you, you inject amount, you know, uh, some amount of gas into the well, it will always work. But at the same time, it's very difficult to, you know, to reach perfections. And to achieve that, you really have to have the years of experience in troubleshooting gas lifted wells. And, and actually, the more problematic well you encounter, you know, you, you tend to build up your experience. Um, now, if you are coming to the, you know, to the new organizations and your aspiration is to, you know, is to become a manager as soon as possible, you don't necessarily have that time to build up that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of competency and, and skill sets in that area. And, and that is what we are seeing in, in Asia, uh, that we have a lot of young people just don't have the luxury of building up to that level. Um, the, another issue we are seeing is the younger generations uh, is seeing that, you know, gas lift itself is quite old technology. Um, to be honest, there hasn't been a lot of r and in, in, uh, in this area. Uh, I think, um, uh, for example, David mentioned about electric gas. I think, David, you can correct me, you know, if I'm wrong. I think the uh, electric gas was first, you know, uh, looked into by Shell, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think it's only just uh, a few years ago it has becoming, uh, you know, a more serious in commercialization. So you could see that, you know, uh, just one technology, it took so long from, you know, from R&D to, uh, you know, to uh, commercializations. And that itself is 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 uh, is quite small compared to other technology in, in the market. Um, another challenge we are facing is the uh, younger generation. They are actually quite mobile, and, and very often, you know, um, oil and gas industry might not be their last jobs. You know, you see that a lot of them, you know, coming to the workforce in oil and gas industry. Uh, after a few years, they could exit the industry and move on to other industry altogether. I mean, like what is happening now with the uh, the current uh, oil crash and with COVID-19, you know, where the market is very depressed and a lot of the younger people actually found that, you know, it's much easier to, to earn a livelihood, you know, in other um, industry. And, and because of that effect, we are continuously losing, you know, technical people and, and, and also uh, not to mention, you know, gas lift community. Um, we also see the effect that uh, there's really uh, not much of a gas lift engineer roles in, in the current uh, organization. You see that uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, in the big organization, they tend to be a job title called gas lift engineers. 
Um, fast forward to today, I think, you know, uh, there's very little company that still have that kind of role. Very often you see that gas optimization is being pushed to gas technicians, which is really not the same as the gas engineer because, you know, the technicians are focusing more on the hardware, like the gas wall, you know, uh, whereas the gas engineer is more about, you know, looking at the analysis, looking at the whole network, you know, it's very different skill sets. Um, gas leaf optimization is also being pushed to production technologies um, and also to some extent to production engineers that don't always have the, uh, they don't always just look at gas leaf because they're also jumping a lot of things. So very often, you know, um, focusing on gas leaf might not be their, 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 the highest priority for them. So that again is the problems uh, for optimizing gas leaf in you know, organizations. Um, and lastly, you, you have very experienced people, you know, very highly uh, trained ups, you know, gas leaf experts in you know, a community, you know, just because they are retired, you know, there's really not a framework for them to come back, you know, to, uh, you know, to give back the knowledge to the younger generation, because um, I mean, sadly, you know, they, the only way for them to to come back is to be employed. And, and because, you know, sometimes some of them, because they are past the retirement age, you know, some company might not get them, you know, in their payrolls. And, and of course, you know, um, a lot of them will not get, you know, will, will not work because, uh, you know, uh, for, for free, because, you know, they have better things to do in, in their life, in their golden, you know, in their golden periods. Um, so that again is uh, is a problem for building up the uh, community in in gas leaf in, in Asia. Um, so there we have already mentioned that in in Asia uh, we have a lot of uh, gas lifted wells and many of them are completed with dual string completions. So the dual string completion has been a huge success. You know, in the nineteen eighties, uh, you look at you know. Um, reservoir management where you have, you have the dual string and it's very good for um, reservoir management that you have one string, you know, dedicated to certain reservoir and you, with the SSD, you're able to uh, optimize the uh, allocation from the, you know, from the various reservoir zones. Um, but when it comes to gas lead, actually it's, it's really quite problematic because uh, you look at, you know, you have two single, uh, you know, you have two tubings. And um, between the two tubing, you could have, you know, uh, eight, nine mandrels and with different gas leak valve, you know, how do you control, you know, the gas passage uh, into the respective string? So for example, you might want to inject more gas to long string, um, but actually the short string is doing all the gas. And, you know, how do you, how do you correct that situation? Um, and the next thing is you have to run some of the uh, very advanced diagnostic like tracer gas a diagnostic like the CO2 tracer or, or the valve tracer kind of, uh, you know, diagnostic to find out uh, just which valve is passing gas. Um, in some of the new uh, installation where you have BTS, you know, that is, uh, that again, you know, is, is, is very easy to detect. But of course, you know, uh, DTS itself is not easy to diagnose. Uh, you, you require some skill set to diagnose that kind of a survey. Um, the next thing is gas lead allocation. So we often, um, I'm sure you already seen the gas lead performance chart from, from David's that for gas lead optimization, you really need to understand how much gas you're injecting. Therefore, you'll be able to optimize uh, the injection rates. Um, so without uh, knowing the actual allocation, so that again is a challenge because of those string configurations. Um, with the dual string configuration, so sometimes you could have one of the uh, instability that start from the string, from, from the short string or the long string that can pass on to the other string. And it's quite difficult to, uh, you know, to, 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 to correct that kind of uh, issue. Um, well, you have the, uh, the, the dual string diagram in front of you. You can see that how the, um, the packer, the first packer is, is quite uh, far from the uh, production zone for the long string from the, re from the, from the lower reservoir. And, and that itself is not optimal for gas lead because you know, with gas lead, you really want to inject at the deepest depths. So very often uh, for long string, we'll have to use a technology called insert string to deepen the injection rate to, uh, to a deep depth so that we can optimize the gas lift injections. And if you have a single string, you won't have these kind of issues. Um, another thing to, to observe is that, you know, because the dual string, you now require twice the amount of gas, you know, to optimize the productions. Um, so this can be problematic when you have, you know, limited compression, you know, capacity and you have very limited, you know, lift gas and you have a huge amount of gas, you know, uh, that you have to inject across 
uh, the different dual string wells and how you optimize. Um, so that again is uh, a huge challenge for gas deep network optimizations. Um, not to mention, uh, in, in general, it's quite difficult to do a gas design for dual string because you really have to take into consideration of the dual string and the interactions. And, and sometimes, you know, the dual strings, uh, both string ha can have very different uh, dynamics. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to point out is a gas leak valve uh, management. So a lot of the time you see that um, we, we have a lot of work that has been installed in, in the well in, in Asia, but really, you know, uh, there's very little amounts of, uh, you know, QAQC, you know, for example, you know, whether it's done right, you know, where are the paperwork and, and who has actually checked it. Um, a lot of the work in Malaysia or in Asia does not have a uh, automatic uh, validation tester, which every time, if you have that, every time you test a gastric work, you have the signature. And, and with that signature, you'll be able to tell whether the work is set properly. Um, meaning to say, you know, if you set the work at a certain pressure, it will always open at that pressure. And, and it's that kind of uh, testing that gives the assurance that the work will work correctly when it's installed downhole in the well. Um, so very often you see that without that kind of uh, checking, you know, you can't really guarantee, you know, uh, what is the actual performance of the gas valve, you know, downhole. Just because you've designed it on the paper, it doesn't mean that it will work like that, you know, in, in actual installations. Um, and also, you know, accountability, you know, who is, you know, whose accountability is that, you know, is that with the operator or is that with the service uh, company that actually provide the gas valve? Um, we also don't have, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we alluded to the subject that there's very little um, emphasis on a gas valve a database. Uh, very often you see that the database is actually just the Excel spreadsheet. And, and you know how uh, elusive Excel spreadsheet is, you know, it can be lost and it tends to uh, follow somebody. And when I mean, that somebody, you know, move on to a different role, you know, and that is lost. Um, and, and, and because of that, you know, we don't always have a good pictures of the uh, gas leak valve uh, inventory. So in some cases, we, we have a gas leak valve that are uh, installed in the well, and it can be as long as 10 years without, you know, pulling out, without replacement. And when you try to pull it, you find that the valve is stuck in the hole. Um, so the good practice is that we should try to optimize the well every two years. And, and because we don't have that inventory and we don't have that database, uh, we are not always on top of things in, 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 in when it comes to a situation like that. And, and also some of the uh, gas leak valve, you know, we have a huge issue with inventory. Um, for example, uh, maybe some of the uh, supplier might not have, uh, you know, they don't store the inventory longer in Asia. So you have to wait for a very long lead time, you know, to be, uh, to be delivered from the Western world. Um, so in uh, Asia, we are looking at, uh, we, you know, we, we have a lot of stranded uh, facilities, stranded uh, reserve, you know, stranded uh, platforms. Um, the issue is always, you know, how do you, how do you bring the gas, you know, to the, uh, to the stranded facilities, you know, uh, where is the, uh, the source of this gas, you know, you know, uh, if you have to install, you know, uh, the pipeline, you know, would the cost be recovered, you know, because it's a small reserve. And, you know, uh, and the gas also requires certain pressures, you need a compressors and whether you can afford that. And, and also if you are stealing the gas, if you are, you know, um, taking the gas from an existing network, you know, how do you ensure that, you know, you're getting the right distributions uh, to the stranded assets. Um, last but not least, I think this is quite, quite uh, obvious for offshore uh, operation is you always have to deal with monsoons and and that also presents uh, problems like uh, you know uh, accessibility you know when you have a bad weather you cannot really um, get onto the platforms to do gas leaf uh, optimization related activities so you have to wait that could also lead to you know weather downtimes and if you have a group of platforms or wells, you know, in, in, in the vicinity, you know, then it's all about, you know, uh, planning, you know, how do you plan so the resources, you know, to, to go around the different platforms and try to optimize the whole usage and basically try to get, you know, um, efficiency from the assets. Um, so with that, I, I, I end my, uh, my presentation. I, I think I might have gone a little bit overboard with time, but uh, hopefully we can catch up with the uh, Q&A sessions. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Terry uh, and David for your very good and informative uh, presentation. It was a lot to learn and I appreciate your time again. So now uh, I'm going through the, there are actually, it was very interesting and we had um, a lot of questions that uh, I, I hope we can catch up some of it at least. Uh, I'm starting with the first question uh, from Elijah, uh, which is uh, actually uh, asking about which artificial leaf type will give the maximum oil recovery with lower investment costs and how long does artificial leaf takes before it is spoiled and being replaced by another one? That's a question. That Do you want to take that, David? Yeah, it's, it's a question that um, comes into, uh, would take a long time to, to answer and it would probably have its own session. It's all about artificial lift selection. It's all about your field development plan. Um, you need to know all of these things before you go and make your decision. Uh, in a lot of cases, you are restricted to gas lift purely by location. That's the thing. Gas lift is um, probably preferred in a lot of cases because as Terry mentioned, there's one thing about gas lift, it's, it's very forgiving. If you start pumping and you're using pumps and they're becoming prevalent offshore, ESPs or things like that, remember a pump is either on or off. Gas lift in most cases is always on. It may be inefficient, but it's still producing oil. So you saw the list I had up about how you select what is the best um, artificial list system, but that should generally be done at the beginning of your field development or um, updated as you go through your field development plan. And each year you do your, um, your business plan, then you should be looking at your artificial lift strategy and your artificial lift development plan. And really that's the only amount of time I can give to it at the moment, but it's a, it's a good point to have a good long discussion about uh, on a session into the future. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm going to the next uh, question, uh, which is from Henning. Uh, can you explain how heated gas lift is done and why uh, and have download heating being tried? Okay, um, I saw that question and I wasn't quite sure I understood it. I don't Thing there is such a thing as heated gas lift. Um, we have SAG-D, um, uh, steam assisted um, in um, heavy fields where they inject steam down an injection well and heat up the formation. Um, in cold climates, um, the gas lift is, uh, gas lift gas is normally uh, warm when it goes down the hole and then thermal temperature increases the, uh, the temperature of the gas lift gas, but um, as far as specific heated gas lift, um, I don't believe there's any uh, specific uh, technical um, solution to that. Okay. Terry, have you heard of it? I have not heard of it, but I think uh, it's probably, you know, in the case where you have heavy crews, you know, maybe injecting some, uh, you know, um, High temperature gas, you know, that might help with uh, with the heavy crudes. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, like you say, you know, the gas itself, you know, the heat transfer coefficients. Uh, sorry, uh, gas is actually not a very good uh, medium for transferring heat itself. Yeah. So it's not. And very that's efficient. why I mentioned SAG D. So it's steam alternating yeah. gas, but that is injection and that's pressure support in the reservoir, not um, lightening the fluid column in the well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from Manuel about uh, uh, knowing the flow regime is very critical and for efficiency of gas <laughs> leak and which technology. I think I, I shortly answer this because there are lots of questions. I think there are so many multi-phase uh, modeling that can be helpful uh, from industry. And uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know if you have any idea, but I think for that, uh, uh, I just asked this uh, question because uh, well, uh, I, I, yeah. I think I think David has got a perfect answer to that. Okay, yeah, go ahead. The, then. the perfect answer, Manuel, is small bubbles, <laughs> and you've seen it. It's the holy grail of gas lift. The smaller the bubbles, and the and the, what we can get to bubble flow, small bubble flow, 
in the tubing is the ultimate. Now, how do you do that? We keep on trying, but at certain stages up the well, uh, all the bubbles recoalesce and you end up in slug flow. Uh, if you have high enough velocity, you'll end up in mist flow. That'll help. Um, what happens when you start coning gas into your well? You end up with a nice mist flow. But there are always going to be um, varying regimes uh, of, um, of flow in the gas lift. But the ultimate is to get small bubbles all the way up. And I think you've already seen some of the, uh, some of the discussions and my um, high-speed video on, um, on LinkedIn uh, that shows you how to do that. Okay, thank you, David. Um, the next question is uh, regarding is uh, directed to Cherry. That can you clarify when you mentioned converting old system into a new system for we can say a smart system? What did it uh, entail? Um, okay, so I think uh, from my experience, uh, it's it's about you know putting a uh, flow control valve you know on the gaslift line. So you know all the instrumentation. So making sure that you have uh, you know you have the uh, the flow meter that you can you can remotely monitor. But at the same time, you have the uh, control valve that you can remotely uh, control, and you also have the the well models to achieve you know virtual flow metering. So you're able to tell you know. Um, what is the injection rate down the wells and what is the performance of the well you're expecting from the well models. So uh, that is really, uh, you know, if you like a semi-smart well kind of definition. Uh, thank you. I, and I think this is the last question as we are exceeding the time. Uh, there is a question from May. It's, will it be possible to have a different type of gas lift valve in a dual string compilation? If yes, what are the challenges faced to have both IPO and PPO? in each of the uh, strings. Okay, um, I'll start off. I'm sure Terry will um, add to this. Um, I, um, I was part of uh, two people who gave the first uh, guest lift training course in um, modeling and troubleshooting um, dual guest lift wells. But this was done with uh, Winglu. Um, purely from the fact that you could actually um, analyze a well with, uh, with well tracer technology. What has come from that and over the last few years, we've now seen that there is the ability to mix the gas lift valves. You can have, have IPO and PPO. You can have IPO in one string, PPO in the other. But the trick is you must know the performance of your wells. You must know how much gas you're putting into each string. You must have good control on surface of your gas lift gas going in. And you must have good quality well test data. And once you have that, you can become uh, much more confident in the design of your valves. Remembering that in most cases, uh, the problem is that you don't want your upper valves, which are your PPOs or your IPOs, opening and closing. So therefore, if you get those exactly right, and in any normal gas lifted well, your unloading valves up the hole should never open after you've unloaded. You only lift through the orifice. So you must size your orifice exactly and ensure that you have the right um, settings on your unloading valves and short answer in the end is yes you can now mix valves but you really need to know what you're doing do yeah you? i yeah i'll add on to that as well i think you know i think dual string if you want to mix the uh the ipo and ppo valve i think you know is uh it's actually quite difficult to uh to 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 perfect it you know because uh, even in design i think david has already mentioned you know um, the, de the design philosophy is very different when you're using PPO and IPO. And, and that sometimes, you know, to the people who actually design the gas um, design, it can be quite confusing. 
And so if you thought that is confusing, you know, I bet you, are, you if you are operated at the platforms, when you try to optimize well, is is they actually don't know what is installed down hole. They might thought that you know it's an IPO, you know, a WAF that's installed down hole. So they are trying very hard to chill the casing pressure, but they don't know that you know PPO will not respond to that. And you actually have to choke the uh, the floor line choke to open and open and close a PPO valve. So you know sometimes you know um, it, sometimes it could be the case of you know it's very good you know design on paper, but actually it's quite difficult to to make it work at the field. Thank you so much for your answer and thank you so much from participant uh, that engaged and there are many questions. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have time to continue. So with that, uh, I would like here again, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, that uh, you spend your time and uh, attending this webinar. And um, for sure, there will be a follow up uh, and uh, we will send you a survey for your feedback and expectation from a, a, a technical section is very important for us. Please participate for the survey because based on what you like and what you are interested, we design uh, the next webinars and training and all. And don't forget if you would like to be volunteer uh, either presentation or the other task, send me uh, your name uh, in my email. And uh, the webinar will be recorded in our website, uh, artificial uh, lip section. Uh, so the, also something that I forgot to mention, all the global webinar we have, it will be recorded and it will be available. So if you miss any of them, including this, uh, so you can go back and uh, watch uh, all the webinar uh, and the slides and hearing. Uh, so I would like also to do a special thanks uh, to Mbeki, your teams. Terry was leading and his his team, uh, Fazlin, uh, Madia, Farah, Bos Farah, they really help out with setting up the conference registration and everything. I really appreciate that. And also David Lee, very knowledgeable and uh, informative presentation, both Terry and David. And please uh, stay with us. Uh, uh, and uh, just something that I would like personally to hear from you if you have done any case study to see uh, like gas leaf uh, technology adoption uh, with the digitalization trend. So if you have any topic, any cases that regarding that personally, I'm very interested. Uh, so please send me your topics of presentation and the level of um, uh, engagement you want to have. And again, thank you. And we are done. Okay, um, just quickly, thank you everyone. Um, I don't know whether a lot of people realize I'm in Melbourne. So I'm three, uh, three hours ahead of everyone else. Um, and just a couple of things, Raphael, hi there, long time no see. Gavin, I will get back to you. I'm starting to see flashes on the screen. Um, just remember, I'm a retired old grandpa who has to look after grandchildren, but I will get back to you. <laughs> okay, bye everyone. Have a good day. All right, day. thank you guys. Yeah, it was a pleasure to have you guys here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.